it's Kristen, and I thought of a really good idea on how to help you find something to do when you're outside in the wintertime and the forest looks like this, when there are no leaves and it's really hard to identify all these different species. Now, when you're looking at it, besides those hemlocks over there, this entire forest probably looks like the same species, but there are actually 36 species all around me. Pretty neat, huh? So if we look at this forest, kind of boring, right? Not really, tons of surprises, but let's check it out. So identifying plants and trees is fun, right? When you have these field guides, but the thing that's the problem about them is right here. When the trees don't have leaves, like right now in the winter time, the key part to identifying them is gone, right? You don't have any leaves anymore. And what are you left with? This stick. But a lot of field guides do this, where they're actually missing a key point, which is this little guy right here, the bud. And believe it or not, every species looks very different. So here we have a burr oak, and it doesn't even have the bud drawn on it. So how are you supposed to tell in the winter time, right? Uh, Tabitha. <laughs> okay. So when you're looking at trees in the winter time, you can actually look at an assortment of buds and tell the difference between tree genera and then narrow it down to tree species. One of the first things you can do when you're doing winter identification of trees is try and look at the bark. However, this bark, just looking at it, and I know trees, if I were to just look at this, I would think, eh, it could be an ash, could be a tulip poplar, because it has these nice, distinct marks. And let me show you what other tree species are around, too. There, that is a black cherry, so it looks a little bit different. And then we also have things like maples. So see how that bark is smooth? That bark's super crispy, and then they call this one furrowed crosses. So I've got it narrowed down to either being a tulip poplar or an ash, and the next thing I want to do is look up. Even though there's not a canopy, there might be some clues. And there are clues. See those circular little dark spots? That is the seed pod or seed structure of tulip poplar. We have a couple of them over there, and if we were to look back at our other two examples, we got a black cherry missing those balls. We come back down here to that red maple also missing them. So these are all signs of it being a tulip poplar here. But even within this one here in front of me, and that one over here, which is also a tulip poplar, they look pretty different just based off of the bark. So what you can start to do is look around, maybe there's actually um, some epicormic sprouts, which are sprouts that come from the base of the tree, or maybe there's a low branch, and you look for something like this. Um, these branches will have buds on the end of them. And what buds are, so we're going to show you better this way, what buds are, it are just overwintering areas where the leaf primordia are. So that probably sounds really sciencey still, but the leaves are folded up in these little structures here. This is a bud and this is a bud, and these are both of tulip poplar. You can see, even though they look slightly different, one's just younger or maybe was made later in the season than the other, uh, but they still have some of the same kind of structure. So this tulip poplar bud kind of looks like a duck bill in a way. There we go, finally. So in the springtime, uh, when you get enough moisture and temperature rise, this guy here will open up and a new leaf will come out of there. There are other little buds here that are axillary, and they will also produce leaves, but this is your big leader bud, your terminal bud, that will have new shoot growth every year and then produce leaves too. So you might say something like, wow, that looks really indistinct, and I, oh yeah, Santa. Uh, that looks really indistinct, and I can't tell anything from that. Well, let's look at some compar comparative stuff here. So, um, another popular tree that's throughout most of North America is one of the only thing that is in color this time of year, um, red maple. Let's switch it around. Okay, so obviously I'm not going to identify every species for you in the forest, but I want to show you guys comparisons and that way you can get a good field guide or use the internet to search what buds are. So these are red maple buds and they're red, right? Pretty easy. Um, there's two branches here, and I want to show you guys what really matters is kind of the general structure of the bud and the color. Uh, these, if you get way too nitty gritty with detail, like it has to be two milliliters or whatever, that's going to throw you off. These are both red maple, Acer, Rubrum, and they, uh, they do look a little bit different, but one is just maybe more developed than the other, or one tree got more nutrients, or there was some kind of limiting factor in the environment. So here's a new genus for you, uh, compared to that red maple sample we have. You can obviously see that there's a difference here, right? Well, I have two species in one genera here. 
Um, again, showing you that plasticity that can happen within one species. This guy here is a red oak, and this guy here is also a red oak, but this here is a white oak. And I even have, I was got lucky and there's a leaf sample there. You can see that curled lobe instead of the pointy edges. But this here, the white oak, uh, Quercus alba, has small rounded buds in a cluster. See, there are more buds there than the previous example where we only had one big terminal bud. These guys also have a cluster of buds, but they are very pointy. Uh, every single species in the genus Quercus has a different bud form. This goes with every species that you'll learn about in this little video and then also when you get deeper into it. Um, so these guys on the right are the red oak and again there's that plasticity. This one in the middle is a little bit smaller and the guy on the right is like pretty robust. But they have that same shape and these are the two very distinct differences. And if you know anything about trees, there are two gro uh, large groups in Quercus where it's the white oak on the left and the red oak family or group on the right I should say. And the other species that are in those groups of white oaks, like, you know, bur oak and swamp white oak, they will have similar buds to this white oak. They'll be rounded, um, probably smaller, but they have distinct features that you can tell. Maybe they'll be a, uh, they'll be hairy, which they call tomentose, or maybe, man, this is so shaky, I'm so sorry. Um, maybe it'll be, um, there'll be some striations on them. And when you have hybrids, which is possible, you can see both features of both species that hybrided hybridized in that individual. There we go. This guy here is a black walnut, uh, Juglans nigra. And it has another feature that you can use to identify uh, trees based off of something called a, doo -doo -doo, there we go, bud scar. So see that little thing that looks like a cute little monkey face wearing a hat? This is the bud, the top of it, that little hat, and this is called a bud scar. So this is where the leaf was attached and then it dropped off, leaving that scar on the stem. And you can progressively see them down the stem until it gets older and they disappear, kind of just because the tree continues to grow. But um, the bud scar of most species will be very different. Do you see the little dude crawling around? Hmm, neat. Okay, so this uh, bud scar can tell you additionally with uh, what different species are in a genus and it can narrow it down and they can be very, very distinct. Maybe one will have a flat top uh, instead of a U shape, it can be very minute, but it can be very helpful when the buds look similar, such as um, white walnut or butternut and black walnut look very similar. And again, there are other features in tree branches that you can tell. This is a characteristic of juglans where they have a chambered pith, which is this right here. The center of the stem is called the pith and it has these little chambers in it and one will be lighter, light tan, like this black walnut, and the white walnut would be dark cherry. Not dark cherry, it would be dark chocolate. Sorry, thinking about food. This here is a hickory, and I don't know off the top of my head which one it is, sorry, I can go back and look in a book, I guess. But here again, we can talk about that big bud, very characteristic of the genus Caria, which all the hickories are in. But then there are these bud scars, which are very distinct and very different. Uh, very thin branches with some small buds. And if we look closely at these buds on the side, they actually kind of look the same, right? They're kind of pointy. Um, they're kind of right on the edge of the stem there. But this here is a uh, Betula lenta, and here we have the uh, black cherry. Uh, these two are interesting to be comparative with each other, and I wish I could explain this, but we don't have smell-o-vision yet. So if you were to scratch this one and smell it, it would smell like birch, which is, smells menthol-y. So you can use that to distinguish the tree species because of those secondary metabolites, menthol. And here, the black cherry, if you scratch that and smell it, it will smell like almonds because of the secondary metabolites in that are very pungent as well. Okay, this bark here is Betula lenta, black birch, and it has some very characteristic features on it, such as these little horizontal stripes, which are called lenticels, and that is where gas exchange happens, just like uh, stomata on the leaves. But when you see this, uh, it's a darker color, kind of matches that black cherry color, but it doesn't have the plates like black cherry does, and also has these lenticel structures. This is a tulip poplar here, and you can see those fissures that aren't exactly doing the cross 
like they were on the previous example that we used to start the video off with. And again, that's just that lesson that trees or plants or mushrooms or bugs or whatever don't read the textbooks that we make about them. So they kind of have general rules, but there's always room for ex exception. But you can see on this guy that there is some white coloration when you look at these fissures. That's kind of characteristic of the tulip poplar. It makes it easier to tell the difference between that and an ash tree. This bark is of a white oak, and it kind of has um, this blocky structure down below. And when you look up at the canopy, which we can't see, uh, you'll notice that there are large plates. Oh, there, that's a much better one. Let's go walk over and see it. Okay. So if we go walk over here, see how those blocky structures on the tree on the left? These are both white oaks, by the way. Um, on the left, they kind of get longer and look like long plates, long slats. So those are Quercus alba. This mostly smooth bark here is of red maple, Acer rubrum. Uh, the tree always starts out kind of smooth. As it gets older, it gets these fissures here, but it remains mostly smooth. This is a classic black cherry. See these potato chip? That's what they taught us in forestry school. Burnt potato chip like plates on the tree and they will get darker and bigger as the tree gets older. But another thing that you can use, remember I said how well, maybe you can't tell from the bark, you gotta get a branch, you gotta look up, um, or look for small little branches. Here, check out this guy. So that growth right there is a fungal pathogen called black knot, which only infects prunus species. So this is in, uh, this is prunus serotina, or serotina, however you wanna say it, but it gets infected with black knot, and you can use that as a characteristic defining, I don't know, identification skill. There we go. So knowing pathogens that grow on certain species can help you narrow down your choices as well. On the left we have a white oak and on the right we have a red oak. And if you can tell a difference just by the color right there. And uh, remember I told you that these big plates will start to form on the white oak as it gets older. Well, there they are. It's kind of a younger tree. But here, this is the red oak, which is characterized by having these ski trails. I never really kind of understood that. But if you look up, they kind of see those lines, those like white lines that all form and morph together from that. You can use that as a distinguishing factor for Quercus rubra. Okay, your hickories are probably one of the harder uh, genera to distinguish species, for me anyway. But you can tell by this braided plated bark here, the entire tree will be this and uh, you can see some platiness of it coming off and sort of sloughing off to make these big sheets. Actually, a lot of uh, bat species like to hang out underneath the bark of hickories, especially shag bark. So you can tell by the shagginess of this braided bark what species it is, and sometimes uh, also the thickness of these braids. But your caria species always have these nice crisscrosses. There's also something else that you can like use as kind of a precursor to figure out what trees you might be looking at. Um, so I'm in a forest right now with two kind of areas. So let's check it out. I've got an area that's uphill. I want you to notice that they're all hardwoods, right? So even just like standing in one spot, when I turn downhill, see all that green? Those are all hemlocks. And if you listen, besides the truck pollution, you can hear there's a stream over there. Um, so site dependency. So a lot of these things up on top of the hill there, a lot of tulip poplar, looks like some uh, chestnut oak, which like rocky, well-drained soils. What the heck is that over there? Oh, nothing. All right, and then if we look this way, you got all that hemlock down there. It likes that stream and those moist, rich, nutrient-rich soils. So thanks for watching another one of my videos. And uh, I'm just trying this out. God, she's so cute with her chubby little chin. So we're just trying these videos out and uh, maybe they'll get better someday. But right now I hope that they can help you explore nature and figure out some cool stuff and survive the winter because it's, oh, it's not even halfway over, baby. Keep trying. Thank you. Bye-bye.